this is Annie Grace and welcome to the Snake in Mind podcast. Today I have Erica with me and she's going to tell her story. Erica, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thanks. I'm excited about being here. That's awesome. So why don't you um, walk me all the way sort of back to the beginning for you, like maybe your first drink or the early days and kind of where it all started. Sure. Um, so I, you know, I am a member of the This Naked Mind community and I see a lot of different people's stories and I'd say mine is different than some. I did not drink in high school. I mean, it's pretty straight laced. Um, my parents, they, they drank, you know, I mean, I, looking back on it, I can remember parties where I'm sure there was alcohol there, um, but it wasn't that apparent. It wasn't that up front and center. Didn't I didn't really think, oh, I've got to drink to be cool. Well, I mean, yes, there was an association of drinking to be cool, but I knew I wasn't part of that anyway. So I really didn't drink until I went to college. I went to University of Illinois um, and pretty much from the get-go, you're invited to parties and there's alcohol there and it's good tasting alcohol. It's not beer. I mean, it's always something weird, you know, fruity. Um, so definitely in college, I became quite the binge drinker. Um, I didn't drink every night. I was, you know, still pretty studious. I would... Um, drink on the weekends. Occasionally there'd be like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night, but mostly just drinking on the weekends, but excessively. Um, puking usually. I mean, I had a reputation for throwing up. Um, I would drink to excess and I would throw up. Um, and I'd say after I graduated from college, that continued quite a bit. I went, um, I worked in uh, Peoria at Caterpillar and Peoria I feel like it's kind of a drinking town. <laughs> so um, again, the binge drinking was able to continue. I didn't drink, I didn't buy alcohol and have it at home. So at that point, I still was kind of a weekend drinker. Occasionally, if I went out to dinner with a friend or something, we might have a drink or two out on a Tuesday or Thursday. But again, mostly binge drinking on the weekend again, and still throwing up and acting crazy and really think alcohol just let me let loose because I had been a pretty uptight person, still kind of been an uptight person. Um, and, but again, it was sort of contained to weekends more or less um, up until <laughs> oddly when I, so then I, you know, fast forward many years living in Chicago and um, met my husband. I met him when I was still in Peoria, but he was a beer drinker. And, you know, this is also the kind of point in time when it became very cool to like crack beers and to go to crack breweries so that became kind of a thing. I, would, I started drinking craft beer and we would go to microbreweries. And when we lived in Chicago, there was always some place we could go. So it just it gradually started becoming more and more um, of a daily sort of a thing. And maybe not every day, but it definitely was not contained to the weekend anymore. Um, and it continued that way until... Um, Okay, so it continued that way, um, and um, we, it's, oddly enough, I felt like I lived in a suburb where there are a lot of stay-at-home mothers. I am not a stay-at-home mother. Okay, so coming back to living out in the suburbs and being in a community where there are a lot of stay-at-home mothers, and it really became easy to see drinking as a way of handling all of your or avoiding your responsibilities, I think. Um, and I, it, it just was sort of a slippery slope where I started drinking much more frequently. It was very, very rare if I had you know, wine that I would have a glass or even two. Usually it would be three, sometimes a bottle. So that sort of became much more of a pattern for the past couple of years. Um, and then the, and, and we would have part, it also became sort of a, a way in which I would determine who I would be friendly with. If somebody wasn't a drinker, I would like sort of write them off. It's like, oh, they're probably not much fun. They're not my kind of person. Um, and I looked for any social opportunities where drinking was involved. Um, it's if there was some. I remember being um, going out to dinner one time with my family, and my parents suggested a restaurant, and they mentioned that it didn't have alcohol, and I was like, well, of course we can't go there. And, and my parents were like, oh, of course. And I don't really think it mattered to them. I'm sure they went to this restaurant plenty of times, but I was like, you can't be serious. Like we have to, we have to drink. We of course have to drink. Um, and so then the point at which it just became overwhelming and it was again, sort of a slower realization for me. I had, my, my friend reminded me of this, this past St. Patrick's Day, 
we had gone out and um, it was sort of a planned thing. She was a huge drinker too. She and I both drank a lot together. In fact, we drank a lot together back when I lived in Peoria and kind of all throughout our 20s um, and 30s. We were both big drinkers. So we had determined we were going to go out for St. Patrick's Day, my friend and I. And it was definitely going to be a big drinking day. Um, but I also was figuring that we would go out. And at this point, I sort of knew that I was like, okay, I really can't just keep drinking. It's not healthy. It's not good for me. I knew this. Um, so I was thinking, we'll go out to a few bars and we'll probably go home about two. And there was a point at which um, we were out drinking and I thought we should go home. And she's like, no, the, you know, the guys are watching our kids. Why are, we, why are we still staying out? Why don't we keep drinking? Why don't we keep drinking? And I was like, okay. But I kept at various points in time saying, I think we're alcoholics. I think we need to go to AA. I think we need to go to well, rehab. We always talk more about rehab. We need to go to rehab. Um, and she'd be like, stop saying that. I don't want to think about that today. Um, and it's not the first time I had brought it up because we had, when people come to our house, a lot of times I like make sure we're fully stocked with alcohol. And I really do encourage people to drink. I mean, people who are like, ah, it's like, I try to figure out then for the next time they come, well, what's the one thing you like? And then I want to make sure I have that because I really wanted people to drink with me. Um, so there had been a time not too long after that, where she came out and we were having people over and she was encouraging the shots and I was willing, of course I was, but you know, it's like, okay, well, she's the one who brought it up. So yes, we'll do the shots, even though we've already been drinking plenty of beer and I've been drinking wine. Um, and we, to the point where we were even lying to my husband, my husband was like, are you doing shots? And I was like, kind of gave him a look. And then um, my friend's like, don't worry. I told Dave that you poured it, poured it down. I was like, okay, so now we're really lying about how much we're drinking. And at the point where she, and we would talk about the fact that during the day with our kids in the house, we would do shots by ourselves with our kids. Like not the kid drinking the shots, but like to avoid or have it feel more fun. We would, and once she started telling me she was doing this, then I started doing it too. And so I was buying, you know, bought a big bottle of um, uh, whiskey and I would do one shot of whiskey. No, no, I need to. Um, this would just be a random middle of the day Friday after my son was home from preschool. Um, my husband didn't know about that. Um, and that was pretty, because I work other than Friday, like it was pretty contained to either Friday or the weekend. My friend though, she was doing this more regularly. And again, it felt kind of like, okay, this is what we do now. This is, this is just part of our life and we drink like this. Um, but that particular day that she came to the house and we had drank these shots and then when she was on her way home, her husband told her he knew how much she had been drinking. He knew that like she was sometimes drinking like a bottle of vodka, you know, it was like gone and she'd replaced it. He knew this. And so he got her to admit she had a problem and she decided she was going to talk to her mother-in-law who was an a, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous person. So she started down the AA path at that time. And my friend told me this and not, I, of course I had thought the drinking was too much and I had thought about Alcoholics Anonymous, but I also felt that that just didn't, that seemed daunting. It seemed, my husband had even mentioned Ebert, um, who was Roger Ebert, had been an AA person and he had sent me an article from Ebert and I read it and I was like, eh. Like it didn't make me want to be a part of it and it did make, it felt too cultish to me. So um, Facebook had recommended some book to me through its algorithm or whatever that was about controlling your drinking. And I read it and I was like, this one doesn't seem quite right. So then I just went online. I thought, well, maybe there's a different option of something that might be more about controlling your drinking. You know, if I don't want to go AA and I don't want to stop drinking altogether, clearly I can't control it. And that's when I came upon your book. Um, and I think just based on the reviews that folks had, um, it seemed like it was the better option, like probably the best option out there of a book to read to talk about controlling your drinking. And when I started into reading it, I was really hoping that I could still maintain the drinking somehow. May, I mean, not to the same level, but I had hoped I would be able to moderate better. Um, and I read the book and I will say, you know, I read it relatively quickly and I was like, mm. and my friend is a nutritionist, by the way. So I would tell her about some elements of the book and this, that, and the other thing. And she, my friend would argue and not argue, she's not really argumentative, but she would say, well, I don't think drinking is always, she, she definitely had a position on alcoholism and not being an alcoholic um, based on the AA model. And she, you know, objected to the idea that anybody can become addicted and that no, of course there are differences in people where some people are, you know, going to be like her husband could just have one drink and be fine. Whereas she was going to drink a lot. And I just kept thinking to myself, where do I fall on this? I don't feel like I am a true AA alcoholic, um, but 
but I definitely am having an issue with drinking. So your book was very good. Um, I thought it was very good, but again, at the same, and I definitely going through it, I'm like, okay, clearly, you know, she's suggesting that being alcohol free is, well, that wasn't a term in the book. It was something I found in the community later. I don't recall that term AF being a thing then. Um, but it definitely seemed clear to me, okay, clearly the best positioning here is to not drink at all, but, but at the same time, whatever limited consumption you can have is a good thing. So let me try that. So after I read the book the first time, I did attempt to moderate and it, somewhat of a success. Um, I mean, at least I kind of was questioning when I would go out to drink, like, why am I thinking just it's the middle of the day at noon? Like, why do I think it seems fun to drink? Um, we also went on a big trip to Spain for three weeks. And my brother-in-law around this time also had gotten some sort of diagnosis with um, high liver counts. So he was trying to cut back. So I was like, okay, I should be cutting back too, but we're going to Spain. And he sort of said the same thing. So we were like, well, we're going to drink in Spain, of course. And I did pretty good. But again, it's like I still had this tendency to drink more than I wanted my husband to know because he definitely had observed a lot of um, concerning patterns with the drinking. Um, and so we came back and I just felt like I was like just kind of in a panic about things. And I was definitely drinking um, I didn't really know how I was going to stop drinking and I didn't know what else was going on with me. I felt like I have anxiety and I felt like the anxiety was getting worse. And then one night I had gone to a fundraiser where, um, the drinks weren't free. No, they definitely were not free. We were still paying for them, but it was a karaoke fundraiser. And of course I have to be drunk to karaoke. So, and I was with a friend who was a very heavy drinker. Um, as well, she and I, and I think I have definitely had surrounded myself in these circles with people who really enjoy drinking because I did as well. So she was buying me more drinks than I had wanted. And I was, of course, going to drink them. What am I going to do? Pour it down, you know, make her drink it. I mean, we both, I mean, I was not far from home, but I did drive myself that night. So that night when I left and I drove home, I don't remember the point of getting home and going to bed at all. What I remember, what I know is I woke up in the morning and my husband wasn't in the bed and I was like, huh, last night was probably not a good thing. Um, and then I asked my husband about, uh, and, and also I should say that after I read your book, I went and I joined the online community, um, this Naked Mind community. And I started, you know, posting and blogging. I thought it was a great thing. And I thought, you know, interacting with folks who were also trying not to drink, but weren't putting themselves through AA were maybe the right scheme for me or the right way to go. Um, so after this whole night happened and my husband, you know, I definitely got, I had argued with my husband many times when I was drunk, not argued, yelled at him and been like, oh, I'm going to divorce you. And just basically because I said he was controlling because he was trying to control my drinking. It wasn't that he was controlling in any other way. It was trying to control my drinking, but I said that was controlling. So I would be like, I'm going I'm to leave you and say things like that. And I didn't mean that, but I would do it. And um, then this time it was like, okay, I realized when I woke up, He's not saying, and I asked him, and he's like, well, I wasn't going to argue with you in your condition. And it wasn't, you know, something, but I'm sitting there thinking, this is the most realistic point at which this could lead to divorce. <laughs> it's not when I get mad and say he's controlling because he doesn't want me drinking anymore. It's the fact that I, I drove and came home and blacked out, left the car running, which I've done sober because it's one of those push button things. And sometimes you can't hear. So like, I tried to tell that to him, but he's still like, come on. Um, and, uh, but yeah, completely blacked out. So then again, I was like, okay, well, yes, I will. I'm going to go AF now because I had been considering the alcohol free thing ever since joining the community and hearing people talk about it. Um, but I didn't think that that was like kind of a reasonable way of life for me, I guess. So, but after that night, I was like, I do, I really need to pull the plug here. What am I doing? And, um, so I kind of went back to it and, um, went out of the community and was very active on the community. Um, I felt like, and, and I, you know, went through the first week, I, um, I definitely had a, a problem sleeping because I had been, um, a person who I, I, unlike some people on the community or some people like that describe their own stories, I wasn't the person who would go into work hungover or would be like, I was, had gotten to a point where I knew how to drink right for me. <laughs> I knew how to, I would drink, you know, every, between every sip of wine and have water and, you know, I would know when to stop it in the evening so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't drink until midnight and stay up until midnight. No, I would pretty much go to bed by 930 and hopefully have stopped drinking by nine. Um, and most of the time I did. So I had become a pretty savvy drinker. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not like 
generally I wasn't driving drunk because usually I had a driver. I mean, I would go, if I knew I was drinking, I'd have someone picking me up or my husband would be um, driving. Um, but it would limit where I would go. I would think, oh, maybe I should go and do this thing. It's like, mm, no, because if I do that, and no one's, then I'm going to have to either not drink or drive drunk. And I don't want either of those situations. So I would avoid, you know, something that wouldn't let me drink. Um, so once, you know, getting into the community and hearing people talk about their experiences AF, it just took a bit of a mind shift. And it, but the book, the, the whole element of it affecting your subconscious, I think is very, very true. Um, because it, as much as I still have cravings and this, the last day I had this, you know, occasion was August 30th. Um, and, and today it's November 16th. So it's been, you know, a couple of months. Um, I had a lot of urges right away. Um, in my first week, you know, I had trouble sleeping, but then after the first week I got over that and I didn't have any other sort of withdrawal symptoms, I wouldn't say, but the urges were certainly very strong and I really wanted to drink. Um, and especially around the end of the work day. Um, but, and, but I would say that some of those are gone now, but occasionally they do come around. Um, but the thing is, and, and even in the moment when it's like, oh, I could have it, I could have a drink. There's a bottle of wine right in front of me. And, you know, I'm at a mommy play date. Well, the kiddo play dates and the moms have wine out. And I'm like, I, I could just have a glass of wine. Um, but there, there's also a part of me, and it's definitely, I think, more of a subconscious thing. It's like, you don't want it. You're not going to be happy. You know, once you drink it, you're not going to really feel like, don't act like this wine is something that's going to make you have better enjoyment. Like, that's not it at all. It's just, it, is, it had definitely become uh, a crutch for me and had become something that I associated with all of the fun and social interactions that I wanted. Um, so I know that's a little bit of a, you know, just kind of um, garbage out of the mouth of everything, you know, a lot of things no, I was about drinking, but... Um, yeah, it makes so much sense. And it's so good that now you can come into that kind of conscious space and say, okay, well, all the moms around, like, it is just, it's really great to be able to sort of identify that trigger and that thought process and be like, okay, but is that real? Like, is that a real outcome? Or is this just something that because I've done it for so long and been in this scenario for this many times that this is very much a trigger. Um, one of the cool things about <clears throat> triggers I guess cool and not cool. Cool in the sense that um, they really diminish once you deny them once, one or two times. Mm -hmm. Like just getting through those first times. And I don't know if you've noticed this in your experience, but if you go to the mommy play date and mm -hmm. you don't give in to the trigger, yes. then the next one, it's like so much easier. Yes. I noticed that with going out and especially with restaurants. So um, I had gotten to a point where almost every restaurant I've been to since we've lived in the suburbs here for six years, I was so used to drinking at every restaurant. Sometimes we would just go out because I wanted to drink out, not because like the food wasn't that good and I'd probably rather eat at home, but I wanted to have a drink out. Um, so once I had stopped drinking, so going to the restaurant, it was like, okay, what am I going to drink? But once I've been there one time and gotten something else, then it was like, okay, now I can picture and it's like imagine the experience and imagine the enjoyment of the experience without the alcohol. Um, I definitely had that happen. My sister's house was oddly a trigger for me. And again, it's because my brother-in-law liked to drink a lot too. Um, my sister drinks very little, very little, but it's kind of the scenario where I would be like, Hey, I got this bottle of mold wine because you know, she likes something more fruity. And um, so like my sister's house going over there, it's like, Oh, but how is that going to be fun if we're not drinking? I'd been over there once before and, well, maybe three times. And once was a big party, but my friend, the same friend, the nutritionist who is in AA, you know, we were there to support each other. So that was sort of easier to keep the desires, you know, from, from drinking from happening. And I did actually observe some of the folks I would typically drink with seeming a little silly and like not really at their best. Um, so it's, it's very interesting when you're not drinking and starting to observe that and realize, huh, Okay, so yes, I, I definitely was having a good time when I was one of them, but from an outsider looking in, it looks sort of silly. <laughs> um, but then when I've gone to my sister's house now a couple of times, the most recent time was like a week ago. And again, um, we, we, I came in, my brother-in-law had some whiskey, and I thought, oh, that seems fun. And um, he, I, I had a sip. I'm like, let me try it. And I had a sip. And I was like, ooh. And then I'm thinking, I don't, I don't want any more of that. Like, I don't. Like, I 
I, but it, it bothered me for some reason that my sister was having two bottles. Uh, she, cause she, again, she's not a big drinker, but she had two hard ciders. My husband has also been engaging in this path with me, even though he doesn't have the issues I do, but he realizes it's always better to not drink that much anyway and felt like he was probably drinking too frequently as well. So he's pulled back quite a bit, but you know, occasionally he will. So he had had a beer and then he was having a cider with my sister. My brother-in-law is drinking the whiskey relatively heavily. And so I found, I was sitting on the couch with the kids and my husband later was saying that, oh, you weren't really very social. You weren't like, I mean, I was interested in watching the music videos that my nephews were watching anyway. So there was sort of that to it. It wasn't like I was necessarily avoiding, but at the same time I thought, well, what would I rather be doing now? Would I rather be sitting at the table sort of getting drunk with people? Or would I rather be sitting here sort of interacting with my nephews while they're watching a new music video of a band I really love? Like, it just, that was kind of more what I wanted to do. And it wasn't, so I think people sometimes, and especially my husband can be easy to, when I am a heavy drinker and I'm drinking heavily, anything that he perceives as, well, that's a negative way to act or why are you acting that way? It's easy to blame it on the alcohol. So now I think it, like this naked mind, like it really does remove a lot of things that people can either blame on it or that you blame on it. That's awesome. I remember when I lived in Brooklyn, there was a restaurant that didn't allow alcohol and it was like an Indian restaurant and they didn't allow alcohol. And I loved the food, but like we would specifically not go there because yeah. we couldn't drink. And then eventually they let you bring your own in and it was like such a relief. Like, and then it became like our favorite restaurant because we could always bring stuff, but it was amazing how much those sort of decisions like influenced all the stuff we were doing. Yeah, you know. there, um, I was just reading, we have in our suburb, we have a, a moms and dads, you know, Facebook group and people comment on various things in the um, area. And just today they were talking about a restaurant and they're like, I think it's really gone downhill. They were going on and on about it. And, you know, someone mentioned, well, I stopped going there after they stopped serving wine. And I was thinking, oh, they stopped serving wine and been there in a while. But that would have been me. Like, had I not yeah. stopped drinking and had it like, <laughs> trust me, I like six months ago, if we had gone there and they hadn't had wine, I would have probably told my husband, let's go somewhere else. I, I, and I might have been like shocked, acted crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I totally get it. I really like that though, that, you know, just trying and, and even sort of taking a step and saying, yeah, no, that's not for me. I remember one instance, um, it was probably three or four months after I'd stopped drinking and I had a business trip to Brazil. And they were there was, it was so weird. It was like, they were literally insulted if I didn't try their national drink called a Cipriana. And I'm like, I'm not drinking anymore. Uh -huh. And it was, it got like almost really heated and stuff because they have this special alcohol that's made out of sugar cane. And it was like very, almost a prideful thing. And I remember one of the guys we were with had to tell this other guy, like, dude, you need to leave her alone. Um, but then I was like, you know what, just let me touch it to my lips. Let me have a sip. Let me, oh yeah, that's interesting tasting and stuff. But it was really almost um, an empowering thing to be like, you know what, I'm going to indulge you, but then I'm going to make this decision that I didn't actually want that. And so it was really cool. So I, I really appreciate that too. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you the question that I always sort of ask kind of at the end of the story is, you know, if you were going to go back and, and talk to Erica of, you know, a few years ago or Erica who is, you know, driving and, not remembering it, leaving the car on, which I understand, I would do something like that too, even sober, if, if it was that difficult of an ignition. But um, what would you tell her about kind of how things are going these days? I think, oh my goodness, what would I tell her? It's so hard to say. Um, well, first of all, there's the health element of drinking. I mean, it really is so unhealthy for you. And I don't, there are all of these articles out there that talk about how, oh, just having a glass of wine. And that, you know, there's such a suggestion that drinking is positive and good. And, you know, and there is a lot of societal pressure. I don't think I remotely realized that um, a few years ago until, until this all started, frankly, in reading the book. Um, and I mean, I guess it's helpful that you work in the alcohol industry um, because that sort of makes you think, okay, well, this is from an insider who knows, and it's not just that, like there's probably anything different in that industry than any other industry, but I'm very skeptical of, you know, corporations and their lobbying. So of course they want to sell their product. They want to make money selling their product. So the alcohol industry has been quite successful in, um, making people real think it's a good thing. 
think drinking is a positive thing. Yes, you're not supposed to drink and drive, but are there really enough things in place that would prevent that? I mean, I mean, in almost any instance, I mean, in Peoria, I, I had an ex-boyfriend and uh, well, I have an ex-boyfriend, time boyfriend, and I remember him joking saying, we sh the, the, the town should just pass an ordinance that says you're allowed to drive drunk between the hours of like two and five, and then everybody would stay <laughs> off the road at those hours. And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, it, it, we need to be able to drink. The bars are open until four. We got to get home and there's no public transit. And there was, you know, taxis were like ridiculously expensive. Um, so I think just honestly, it's hard to say what I would say to myself. It's more like you got to read this book because <laughs> that I've been a person who it, it, it really does take a book to sort of convince me of something in a book that's very well done with a lot of footnotes. And, and I can't say I always read the footnotes, but nonetheless, like feeling like there, I know how to like evaluate the, um, the primary sources of what someone is claiming. Um, and so for example, I'm a vegetarian and I stopped eating meat. Well, actually I didn't stop eating all meat. I stopped eating um, all meat, but well, I read this book called Diet for a New America back when I was in college and it talked about the meat industry and how meat was you know, produced in our country. And so it was about the, the humane elements and the, um, uh, the health elements. And I was sold on both points. Um, and you know, again, it sort of started out similar to my reaction to this book where I'm like, I'm not going to give up meat. That seems like ridiculous, but I'm just going to try to make sure that it's like um, cruelty free or, you know, free range. But at that time, I think this was like 92 or something. I would ask a waiter or waitress that they didn't know what I was talking about. You couldn't go to a store and get organic meat. Like it just didn't, right. like you didn't have the options that you have today. So at that time I was like, you know what? I read this book and I'm really sold on it. I'm just going to stop eating meat. It didn't talk about fish. So I kept fish. <laughs> um, but so it's not surprising to me that the thing that would finally click and get to me would be a book that's got a lot of information. It's not just one thing. I mean, there's a whole, I mean, there was a lot of research done for your book. Um, so I think that that's maybe what I would tell myself. Um, and I am happier. I, I mean, I am, I do have, you know, anxiety, extreme anxiety. It got better with the drinking. I mean, sorry, better when I stopped drinking because I did not know. And this is again, back to the health aspect of this and how good the alcohol industry has been, you get the idea that, oh, you take a drink to relax and it's going to relax you. And I'm a high strung person. I'm an anxious person. So let me drink. But it doesn't actually help. In fact, it, you know, like various, and I'm, I never remember the science that I read about, but, you know, it says that, that it really is um, damaging to anxiety because of this, that, and the other thing. Um, and I have experienced that firsthand. Um, so I think there's just a whole lot of things I, I would tell myself, here's this book. So that's, I, I mean, I think that that would just be how I would want to introduce myself to the book and the concepts and the way in which society encourages us and to just basically tell myself is bull. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's so cool. Well, yeah, this has been great. I mean, I really appreciate your story. I think it's the story of so many parents, especially with young kids. It was certainly my story. And um, I don't know, it's it's an interesting thing where we all are just kind of doing the best we can with the tools we have. And then we have our eyes open to the fact that there's different tools or the tools that we thought we had might actually be like, you know, yes. <laughs> giving us blisters. Right, right. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's really cool that you've kind of taken and owned that information and, and taken it forward into your own life. So that's awesome. Yeah. So cool. Well, thank you so much for your time, Erica. It's been a real pleasure and I oh, really nice appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> so nice to meet you too. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. This has been Annie Grace with This Naked Mind Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. You can learn more at thisnakedmind.com. And please remember to rate, review, and subscribe as it really helps us spread the word.